I'm here to announce to you that the best part of church is over, and now I'm up here. My name is Michael. I'm the lead pastor here at Long Hill Chapel. We are so glad that you're here. If this is uh, your first time with us, if you're our guest today, uh, we just want to extend you a warm welcome, and we are so glad uh, that you have joined us. And I just leaned over to some of the folks in the, in the front row as we're listening to the, the, the testimonies of the folks being baptized and Jack, and uh, this is what it's about. This is what it's about, is, is people taking their next step with God, and this is what we're about. Uh, and we will never, ever, ever get tired of that. And if maybe something you heard today sparked something in you, that you're like, I need to take that step that those, those, those folks took. Um, we will fill this tank every single week for one person. We'll do it all the time, and we'll never get tired of it because this is why we are here. And we're just so thankful to be part of what God is doing. I, I don't know if you've ever... Uh, I have a new stool, by the way, and it's height adjustable, so I may bump myself up and down a few times. I, I don't know if you've ever uh, gotten in a conversation with someone, or maybe you've gotten in an argument with them, and there's the thing you're talking about, but then there's actually the real reason. It's something I call the issue behind the issue. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, in our household, there are four of us. There's me, my wife, Grace, our two boys, Christopher and Jonathan. And all of us, and my, my son is giving a shout out to me up in the balcony. Thanks, bud. I appreciate you. High five. Um, all of us get hangry. We are all people that if there is no food around and we have not eaten, things are not going to go well. And it doesn't matter what we talk about. It doesn't matter the, 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 the subject matter. We, there's going to be an argument that breaks out. And so we actually have this rule in our house where if we know we haven't eaten and if someone else hasn't eaten, it's just like, everybody, don't talk. No talking. You don't get to, it doesn't matter what it's about. You don't get to talk about it because whatever it is will turn into some sort of argument because there's something bigger under the surface. Some of you all, you're maybe, you know, you're new to faith or you're new to where this is going. And this is just a life principle that you can use everywhere in all of your relationships. It's figuring out, are we talking about the real thing or is there something underneath this that's the real issue? You know, maybe you're married and you, or you have a significant other and you've had one of those conversations and it seems like it's about one thing, but really underneath it, you discover it's about something deeper. It's about a bigger issue. It's about a feeling or a fear or an experience or something that happened in the past. And there's, until you uncover whatever that thing is, you'll never have the real conversation. And I've just discovered that very often in my life, in our relationships, for all of us, there is an issue uh, that's behind the issue. What's this really all about? And you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of heartache if you ask yourself the question about yourself, and when you're in a, in a conversation or dialogue with somebody else, you do exactly the same thing. You say, what is this really about? Are we talking about the real thing here, or is there something deeper uh, that's under the surface? Otherwise, all of those other things as good as they might be, as important as they might be, they can become distractions. They can become smoke screens for what's really going on. Why am I talking about this? Because we've been in this series, as Pastor Joey said a little bit before, uh, through the New Testament book of Romans, which was this man named Paul. He was an apostle, one of the early leaders of the church, writing to a group of Christians who were in the city of Rome, which was like the capital of empire. It would be like a group of Christians meeting in Washington, D.C., or one of the great cities of the world. And so he's leading them through why this faith journey that we have in Jesus Christ is so critically important. And this whole series has been like building blocks. There's been like one week building on the next, building on the next. And if you're here last week, uh, we had a guest speaker, Dan Hutton, uh, one of our international worker partners, and he just preached the house down. It was a great week. I loved sitting there and not preaching and, and getting to hear from Dan. And if you missed that, if you're in the series, you ought to go back and check that out on our website. It's there. It's on our podcast app. It's on our, uh, our, our, our smartphone app. It's in all the places. You ought to catch that one up. But he left in this place talking about the thing that we all struggle with and one of the things that we sang about a little bit, which is this issue of sin. The issue of the fact that we all tend to not go in the right direction. There's this thing that marks our hearts and it marks our lives and we all struggle with a version of it. And he ended in this great place in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 and he said this, he said, For sin shall no longer be your master. You don't have to just give in to it. The thing that is tempting you, the thing that you're struggling with, you don't just have to give in to that thing. It'll no longer be your master because you're not under the law, 
but you're under grace. But this week, it seems like things have changed. And let me be really transparent. This is actually the second message I wrote on Romans, the second half of chapter 6 into chapter 7. The first one was really, really long, and you're all glad that we're not doing that one today. Because we would be here a while, because what happens is the Apostle Paul honestly kind of rambles around a little bit. It's like one of those conversations you have with somebody where they're like over here talking about this, and then they go over here and they're talking about this, and you're just trying to keep up with them. You're trying to keep up with like, what it, what's, the, what's the point here? What's, what's going on? And it's all important stuff, but it's not the issue that's behind the issue. You know that there's something down there under the surface. It's kind of like, you know, if you're dating someone or if you're married to someone, you go to them and you're like, hey, how are you doing? They're like, fine. You know there's something under the surface. You know, they're not, fine does not mean fine. There's more down there that's yet to be uncovered. And so throughout, and I'm going to summarize for the sake of time, the second half of Romans chapter 6, Paul decides, hey, you know, let's talk about slavery. Let's talk about, you know, how we are like, we, there was this thing in the, in the Roman Empire where we don't really have slavery in our time. It's been abolished, thanks be to God. But in the Roman Empire, there was slavery. And there was this thing you could do if you were a slave or a servant. You could actually pledge yourself into the service of another person. You could pledge yourself into their service. And that was usually this relationship between a master and a slave. And it was when it was a good relationship. You could say, I am voluntarily, I'm not going to serve my term and be set free. I'm going to voluntarily serve you for the rest of my life. And he uses that as an illustration to talk about what we get to do when we put ourselves under the rule and the reign of God. And that sounds a little weird because, again, we're not used to those terms. We live in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. But there's something I've realized as I've gotten older, and maybe you've realized it too. We are all ruled by something. There's something that sets the the, the direction of our lives. There's something that sets the pace of our lives. It's even things as simple as like, you know, the clothes we like to wear, the music we like to listen to. Who told us that those were the things that were popular? There's something that we always are looking to, to define our worth, to define the direction of our lives. We're all ruled by something. It's just a matter of what that thing is. And we can choose, he says, to place ourselves under the rule of God. And if we don't, we will still be ruled by something, but it'll just be our nature. It'll be our sin. Tim Keller, who was a pastor in New York, he had this saying that was so helpful for this. He said, you are always bound to something. We don't like to hear that. You don't like that idea. You're like, I'm my own person. I make my own rules. But you don't, and I don't. We just are always looking somewhere else. You know, one of the things, I was a child of the 80s, and for some of you, especially you guys here, it's like, man, you're old. And I am. I was at the barber's yesterday, and they were cutting my hair, and it was funny. I just had this moment where I saw my father in the mirror, except it was me. That was weird. I'm still working that one out. But I was a child of the 80s, and, you know, we had a certain style of dress and clothes then, and it's so weird to see it coming back. Like, man, I should have kept all that stuff. But it's just like, this is something that defines us. We we see ourselves setting the course of our lives by certain things. You're always bound to something. Freedom is not the absence or the presence of restrictions, but it's actually the presence of the right ones. You know, so when we're free, it's because we have put the right boundaries, the right restrictions, We put the right things in our lives, and we said, I'm going to put myself underneath the rule of this thing. Because if I don't, there's something that's going to define me. Whether I know it, and sometimes I do, or I don't. So Paul starts talking about that, but then Paul kind of shifts directions again, and he insults his audience. By the way, that's a bad idea. Like if you're trying to get convinced people of something like saying, you know, you're really kind of thick-headed, and stubborn and not very bright. That's not a good idea, but he does it anyway. 
And it's kind of condescending. I read it, and I'm like, oh man, that, that just seems a little bit harsh. You can tell that there's something under the surface. There's something that's bothering him. There's something that he wants to get out, but he just hasn't gotten there yet. There's an issue behind the issue. And he talks a little bit about how we're all offering ourselves to something. And I think in the moment, just the thing I said, the thing we just talked about, he realizes that he is too, but it's not as easy as it seems like it should be. You know, you hear a statement like this and say, yeah, no, I'm going to put myself under the rule and reign of Christ. You know, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. It's not that simple. We heard a testimony of that this morning. There's a struggle that's involved with that. And the Apostle Paul has that struggle himself. And he highlights it with this famous little passage of Romans that some of us have heard before, where there's that tension between what God has offered us, the gift of God, which is eternal life, which is freedom, which is all the amazing things we sang about this morning. But then this thing that we continue to find ourselves struggling with over and over again. Romans chapter 6 and verse 22 and 23 says this, But now that you've been set free from sin, which is what we talked about, that's a great place to start, and have become the slaves of God, there's that idea he was talking about before, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For here's, here's the famous verse, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so there's this idea that sin earns us something. Wages are something that you earn. There's something that are given to you. There's something that is due you. But God gives us something instead, something so much better in its place. But then he backtracks again. And he goes and he talks about something else. He says this thing about marriage and how marriage is kind of like the law. And you can go read this later if you want. This is in chapter 7. You know, and how it's, it's just like you're bound to it, but then you're free if you die. It's like the ball and chain analogy. And this is coming from a guy who has never been married. So he's just going on about marriage, and he hasn't been married. And he's like, you know, it's just like this thing, and some of you are like, I've got that marriage. That's what my relationship feels like. And he uses this as an illustration, again, to talk about the law, and it just seems like there's an awful lot happening here. And he's got a lot of things that he's facing. He says, you know, it's good when that happens because it makes you face down the death of your illusions about yourself. I don't know if you've had one of those conversations with someone, you're like, there's a lot here. We're still talking, and there's a lot here, but we haven't gotten down to the issue behind the issue. And so with this whole passage of Scripture, there's a lot we can talk about. There's a lot going on, but there's one thing that we must talk about, and it's that issue. And finally it gets uncovered. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Listen to this. I do not understand what I do. I do not understand what I do. So here's the guy who's writing the letter to the people and trying to say, this is how you live. This is why what Jesus did is so important, but I look inside myself and I don't make any sense to me. I don't make any sense to me. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, so he knows there's some things he ought to, he ought to be doing, I don't do but what I hate, the things I know that I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing them. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. Here's what that means. We all agree that some kind of law is good. No, I don't think there's anybody in this room who's like, you know, there should be no laws whatsoever. It should just be complete anarchy and chaos. Even the people who are like, you know, trying to stick it to the man, they have limits. They have things that they think people ought to abide by. 
So nobody thinks there should be no restrictions. Really what it comes down to is this place where we all decide to draw the lines, where we decide the lines ought to be. And conveniently, and we said this way back in the beginning of this series, we tend to draw the lines where it's easier for us and where it's not so easy for the people who are not like us. I'm like a total suburban dad, and I've told you the stories about that, and I live on this road that has a hill coming down it, and we're set back from the road quite a ways, but I'm the guy who goes out and glares people down to the speed limit. Like they're coming, it's a 25 mile an hour road, and it's this big hill, so they just, people come ripping down the hill, and I'll go out to the street, and I'll just stare at them, <laughs> and I'll watch them go by, and I, I have this incredible power. Because I can dad glare people down to the speed limit. And sometimes there was one guy who like honked at me. I glared at him so much. But it's just like, I agree that there should be a restriction there. But yesterday on Route 78, I looked down and I'm doing Hanover. The thing that we all do. It's, hey, it's 75. Imagine trying to explain to your kids, like, I was trying to explain that to yesterday. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I have such a double standard about this. But we all do. We agree there should be restrictions, but we paint them usually for where it affects us the least and other people the most. And Christians, people, church people, we are famous for this. I saw this quote from Douglas Van Nest, who's a pastor, and he said this. He said, it's interesting how quick we Christians are to make the point that Jesus caused offense. I don't know if you've ever heard this. Like, well, Jesus caused offense to people. What's truly interesting about it is how in our conception of Jesus, he's always busy offending everyone else and never us. He's always busy offending the people who sin differently than we do, but never us. Amazing how that works. But Paul's still going. He's still working some stuff out. Verse 17. As it is, it is no longer myself who do it. So this is him talking again about the things that he knows he should do some things. He doesn't do those things. There's some things he thinks he should not do, and he does those things instead. But it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. But I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. And suddenly, I think all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we can relate to this. There's some things we know we ought to be doing. Some of them are very simple things. Some of them are these very high-minded things. I don't think there's anyone in this room who's like, you know what, I should just do terrible things. I should just go do more terrible stuff. Very few people do that. We have the best intentions, but there's this thing that continually seems like it gets in the way. And it's like all the way down from the bottom where it's like, you know what, I should, you know, I should eat less carbs and I should work out more. And that's something I should do, but then I find myself not doing it. All the way up to much bigger things. You know, I should keep my mouth shut, but I don't. You know, I could go down that road in my mind that takes me to a negative, destructive place. I could make that choice, but it's so easy to find myself there over and over again. And this is the human condition. And when we ignore it, we gaslight ourselves. We pretend like it's not there, but this is something we all struggle with a version of. He's not done. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. That's kind of interesting. But it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. That's kind of like, you know, the, the, the angel on the one shoulder and the, the, the devil on the other shoulder. It's that kind of idea. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. You know, we come in here, we sing the songs, we listen to the things, we're like, that sounds great. We ought to do that thing. But then we find ourselves in a struggle. Listen to the language he uses. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law at sin at work within me. 
And then he finally gets down to it. What a wretched man I am. A little intense, but he gets there. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God. This is the good news. Who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so this whole chapter, and I think we need to get this, this is kind of like this internal dialogue where he's working it out. And he finally gets himself down to the breaking point. How many of you are verbal processors in this room? I'm a verbal processor. My wife is not a verbal processor. Most of us who are in relationships, there's one who is and there's one who isn't. And uh, this is why you need friends who are also verbal processors. I have a few friends, I'll just call them like, I just need to talk. I need to work this out. And just as you talk it out, or maybe some of you, you're not verbal processors, but you journal or you spend some time, or you just have a way of working yourself out so you have clarity about what you're really thinking and feeling. I think in some sense, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. You see the conflict within him. You see the struggle that he's trying to work out. He's trying to talk about this thing, but he knows that within himself, there's that same struggle. And it's almost as if, at the end of it all, he finally comes to a breaking point. He comes to a breaking point. Friends, you and I will never move forward until we come to breaking points in our lives. We'll never move forward. You know, I've had high cholesterol since I was in my 20s. I also love cheese. Those two things do not go well together. But I remember when I found the information out. It brought me to a breaking point where I had to do something with the truth that I now understood or not. There are times where we get to breaking points where we realize that the way we have been living our lives the assumptions we've been making, the direction we've been going, it's not working any longer. It's actually taking us in a direction. And here's the problem with this. Until you uncover the issue behind the issue, until you get down to what it really is, you can pile all sorts of things, good things, on top of it. You can pile therapy. You can pile self-improvement. You can pile mindfulness. You can even pile religion, soul care, any of these really good things. But if you haven't gotten to the breaking point, they don't get to the root of the issue. You can listen to Christian radio, you can buy books, you can buy resources, you can go to studies, you can go to all the things we do here at church, you can go to every single worship night, you ought to come, it's going to be awesome. But until you get to the breaking point, none of that, none of that is ultimately going to change much of anything for very long. I love the language that Paul uses, he says, what a wretched man I am. And here's how you have to understand that. He's kind of saying, what a piece of work. I am. How many of you are a piece of work? I am a total piece of work. And so are you. What is not being said there, he's not saying I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, but he's saying I'm a real piece of work. And we all are. You know, I have a lot of friends uh, who work in the recovery field or, you know, in the therapy field. They work with addictions and things like that. And they work with people who are trying to make big changes in their lives. And one of the things every single one of them says is this. They all say this, some version of this same thing, that a person has to wear themselves out before any of that stuff is really going to make a difference. They have to wear themselves out. They have to become so tired of their ways, of themselves, the effect of themselves on themselves, the effect of themselves on other people, they have to look around and say, you know what, I have this string of things in my rearview mirror, broken relationships, or maybe I go from job A to job B to job C to job D, or maybe I'm in and out of things constantly. They have to get so tired of the pattern that then they're willing to get to the breaking point and say, there's something about me that has to change. This isn't about the other person. This isn't about the situation. And this isn't about that boss that is so easy to blame everything else on. Wherever I go, there I am. Wherever I go, 
there I am. We have to wear ourselves out. Like the Apostle Paul, I think, finally here in this spot, and this is really one of the turning points of the book of Romans, he wears himself out. He looks at himself and says, there's something about me that I keep running into. And friends, we all have a version of that something. Until you realize what Jesus can save you from, you cannot truly appreciate how amazing grace is. Now, I want to be absolutely clear in this next moment. This does not mean that you are a dirty, rotten, worthless worm. You know, there's, there's strains of Christianity that kind of say that, you know, it's like God just really wants to open up a can on you. He's so ticked off at you. You know what, friends? Jesus died for you. The God of the universe set his very best to die for you. You are of inestimable worth and value. Back a couple chapters ago in Romans 5, it says this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we had it together, before we cleaned our act up, Jesus came for us. But that's not a pass on this other thing, this issue behind the issue. You know, we're brought because of what Jesus did from darkness to light, but we still have our ways. We still have the way that we are, the things that trip us up over and over again. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever felt this, like you're like, man, I just keep, I can't get out of my own way sometimes. There's these ways that we have. Some of them are minor. Some of them are major. Let me tell you a great story. This is a, my poor wife has been married to me for uh, 24 years almost in May. And uh, she's traveling right now. And uh, we were moving car seats around and dealing with kids. And she's like, Michael, could you get the car seat out of my car? And we had, we had a nanny coming and She's like, can you just leave it for the nanny? Guess what I did? I went outside. I looked at our car. I wandered around the yard for a while. I got distracted by something else. I went back inside. I got my keys and I left. <laughs> this is me. And some of you have been close. You've known me long enough to know that I, I like, I have the attention span of a small rodent. And this is just, this is, and she's, I guess she's, this is my cross to bear. She's kind of finally just accepted that. I, she's a much better, her, her name is very apt. Let's put it that way. Grace, I, I received that from her a lot. But I, I had to text her later in the day. I'm like, you know that thing you asked me to do? And I was like somewhere else, like miles away. I'm like, I just didn't even do it. I just wandered around outside and uh, never took the car seat out. You and I have ways. I have ways. And I look at that, and that's a simple, small, sort of funny, kind of annoying thing. But that's just something that marks my life. It's how I am, and I know it's how I am. And I'm never just going to make excuses for that, but that's a struggle in a small way that paints a picture of how we all are. We all have these ways. And you know what we need to do? We need to name them. We need to name the ways that we are. You know, I'm, I'm still growing in this. Because in that moment, I could have said, you know, I have so much going on, and I'm so busy, and, so, and that's all true. You know, why didn't you ask me earlier? But it's really about my ways. And one of the hardest things for us to do, but one of the greatest starting places for all of us is to come clean about who we actually are. From the very small to the very large. We need to do this because there's something in our nature that tries to get us to kind of deflect somewhere else, right? There's something in our nature that says, oh, you know, it's about that, or it's about them, or it's about that thing that happened back there. But it's really about us. I made a little statement that rhymes because I'm a pastor and that's what they do. There's no shaming in naming. Say that with me. There's no shaming in naming. You can name the thing, and it actually doesn't condemn you. It just brings it out into the open, so now you can do something about it. And I'm not going to give away next week yet, but there's something God, good that God gives us if we do this that we never expect. 
Because the truth is, some of you in this room have an anger problem, and you just need to name that that's what it is. You've been saying it's everyone else's fault, that you've had a hard life, that it's all about them, it's all about that thing. But you, just, these are hard times we're living in, but it's just a problem, and it's yours. There might be things that have put that into your life, but it's now yours to deal with and to do something about. Some of you, you medicate. Maybe you drink a little too much, or you work too much. That's, that's like the, the respectable thing to do to medicate some of y'all you know a lot of bible and you've been to a lot of church but honestly at times you're brittle you're judgmental you're kind of miserable you get a little too happy when the people who break the rules that you don't struggle with get themselves into a hard place you have ways you can actually use god to hide from god some of us are into, you know, finding inner healing and personal development. Those things are super great. You'll, you'll find that there's no greater proponent of that stuff for me. But it's hard for you to look yourself in the mirror for any length of time and sit with the truth of who you are. Let me do, let me do me so I'm not just talking about you. Some of us are constantly tempted to use our performance for God to determine our value to God. I'll tell you what, my journey this past year has been all about that. We're tempted to say, as long as I can do good things, good works, I can put on a good show, I can play or talk or sing or serve nice enough, then God thinks I'm better than I am. And I know better but it's so easy to get back on that train over and over again. You and I have ways. And on and on and on and on. Because the Apostle Paul, like he said, this is a war. This is a war. This is a struggle. It's a war between the hope of Jesus that we have and the gospel, which is such good news, and the reality of our human nature. And we know that the victory in the end is secure. The final outcome is certain, but we're still living down here. We're living in the now. We're looking ahead to the not yet. It's this war between us, but it's this war within us. Look at verse 22 again. He says, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I think, yes, what God says is good. I ought to do that. But then I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. You know, we all feel this. And I think there's kind of two unhelpful approaches that Christians and churches take when it comes to this war. The first one is really, it's condemnation. It's just when someone like me gets up and says, you're all terrible. You're just awful. Like, get it together. Good luck. Go slug it out. Try harder. Do more. You know, and, and, and guilt motivates us for like maybe a little bit, but it doesn't ever change anything. It just pushes all that stuff underground. We're kind of hopeless and powerless until heaven. You know, we just have to hang out and not screw up too bad until we get to the end of things. Friends, in light of what we've read in the book of Romans, and especially what we're going to see in the next two weeks, that is not even accurate. And I want to tell you that Jesus didn't just come to die for you and then to set this standard that you somehow have to keep and say, good luck, I'm not going to give you anything to help you out along the way. Hope you can figure it out. How masochistic would that be? Instead, he's given us something so much greater. So it's not that. And as I said, I'm not going to tip the hand on what happens next week, but it basically throws that whole mindset in the dumpster, and it should. But there's this other thing, and it's kind of what's in fashion a little bit more. It's this kind of therapeutic idea where we, you know, we mine the, path, the, you know, the depths of our past and our parents and our trauma and what happened back there, and, you know, we should go figure all those things out. But those will not solve the problem that we are. There's just this thing that it is about us, that we have ways. There's something about our, our nature that we have to contend with. 
All that stuff is super important. You will always hear me advocate in favor of it. But until we look ourselves in the eyes and we name our ways, it'll never get down to the issue behind the issue. So I think we need to sit here just a little bit. What are your ways? What are your ways? What are the things or the thing or the response pattern or the cycle that you have in your life where it's easy to say oh, it's about that and it's about them, but it's really about you. Maybe it was caused by something, maybe it was reinforced or deepened by something, but really it's yours. It's yours to contend with. What's the part of your nature that you need to face in the light? If you can't answer this question, let me give you a helpful, really, it takes a lot of courage to do this, by the way, a helpful way to figure that out. Ask someone you trust who loves you enough to tell you the truth about you. Ask someone who has your best interest in mind, that's what I mean by that, who you trust, who loves you, who is for you, but is courageous enough to tell you the truth about you. That takes incredible courage. And in that moment, it will be tempting to respond, to rationalize, to justify. It might also be tempting just to be crushed by it. Don't do either of those things. Just listen. And as you sit in that spot between avoidance and condemnation, I want you to remember the last verse the Apostle Paul, as he has his break, says in verse 25, he says this, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you and I have ways. He says that in so many different fashions in, ver in chapter 7. But at the end of it, thanks be to God who delivers me. You're not left there. You don't have to just maneuver around and justify and rationalize and avoid, you know, and move on and do all those things. You have hope sitting in that spot. It's not condemnation. It's not avoidance. It's rescue. It's something that is so much greater. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's where we're going to leave this today. We're going to leave it there. Because this is like one of those two-part movies. If you're a child of the 80s like I am, this is when you walked out of The Empire Strikes Back at the end of it. And you knew there's another movie coming, and there's this little bit of a hopeful turn, but it's not like a great spot. You're not like, yes, everything is resolved. Maybe you're not as old as I am, and so you, you watch Avengers, you know, and there's an Infinity War, and then there's Endgame. And this is like that spot in between those two. And you're like, I have to wait years until the next one comes out? But until we sit here, until we face ourselves here, we're not able to receive the beauty, the depth, the goodness of the payoff, of the victory, of the triumph, of part two. And so you don't want to miss the next part over the next two weeks. Would you pray with me? God, some of us right now are kind of facing something in ourselves or maybe your spirit is prompting something within us and we're, we're tempted to kind of respond how maybe we've responded before, avoidance or rationalization or just to be crushed by it and no, neither of those is the right response. And so God, I pray by your spirit you would preserve us in the tension of the middle in the place where we have to face down what is true about us, but we're not left there facing it on our own understanding, our own strength, our own rationalization. Thanks be to God that you have delivered us, that you, because of what Jesus Christ has finished work on the cross, that we've sung about and that we've celebrated, you've offered us hope. Maybe there's a few here just like Jack's tremendous testimony of your work in his life. We need to receive that gift this morning. And pray a simple prayer that just goes something like this. 
Jesus, I come before you and I have ways. I know I do. I've tried. I've tried to outpower them. I've tried to outmaneuver them. I've tried to run away from them, but I keep running into them. But you are the one who through your finished work has offered to save me from my sin. To restore me and to give me hope. And so I confess my sin to you. I ask that you would save me and be Lord of my life. Maybe for some of you, that's a prayer that is a starting place as you sit in the reality of your ways. That Jesus offers you a hand to reach in to pull you out. For so, some of us in this room, we have a, you know, we pile all sorts of things on top, maybe even some good religious things. But we've never gotten down to the issue behind the issue. As we sit here in this space, as you highlight that in our minds and our hearts, in our memory. I pray that you again would offer us the hope as we sit in the tension of the end of the first movie knowing the second one is coming. We'd fully see this. We'd fully see you. We'd own it. But then we'd realize that you have given us the power to do something about it. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.